Hello there, Nick again, and welcome back, everyone. You made it to Chapter 9 of The 21 Balloons by William Penn Dubois, award-winning children's book that was read to me by my mom when I was growing up as a kid. I loved it. Um, I like to read it to my kids, and I hopefully uh, you and your kids, kids at heart or, or literal children, can enjoy this as we come down to the end of this fantastic tale of Professor William Waterman Sherman. So here we are. Chapter 9 is concerning the giant balloon life raft. Let me see Professor Sherman and Mr. F. Let's see what they are going to find out here. <clears throat> Professor Sherman continues his story. The next morning, I ate breakfast with my fellow Krakatoans at Mr. C's Chinese restaurant. I'll tell you quite frankly that I have no idea of what I ate at any of the meals on sea day. I'm not too partial to oriental food, and I didn't even dare to ask what I was eating for fear that any accurate description or analysis would only add to the uneasiness from which I suffered through each meal. I noticed that many of the children toyed with their dishes with equal apprehension. I used their method of eating some of the portions which consisted of removing the toasted almonds from the top carefully with a fork and leaving the rest. Mr. F. scolded me for this display of timidity and poor taste, and told me that to acquire an appreciation of good food, I should show a little bit more courage and be in a will to experiment. Good advice. I assured him that I had a great desire to become an accomplished gourmet while living under the restaurant government. Remember, that's kind of how they or govern themselves, is by determining which family feeds the rest of the island for the day but preferred to arrive at this in gradual stages over a long period of time. Uh, and I guess that's, again, Professor Sherman and Mr. F. swimming in the water. Mr. F. told me what I want, asked me what I wanted to do after breakfast. I told him that being on the island in the, in the position of a perpetual guest with no work to do, I was fast getting ready to think of living in terms of holidays back home. Um... On a hot Sunday in San Francisco like this, sea day of the month of lamb in Krakatoa, I would most probably go to some beach and do some swimming. I suggested a swim to Mr. F., and he thought this to be a fine idea. So we put on bathing suits and bathrobes and made our way through the outer fringe of jungle to a nicely cleared, fine coral beach. I'd arrived in Krakatoa on the afternoon of A day. It was now the morning of C day. In that short time, I had become quite used to walking about on the moving landscape, because you remember Krakatoa's active volcano, and uh, we, heard, we learned in earlier chapters that the ground literally shakes beneath them, even though there's chunks of diamonds everywhere buried under the island, the ground has that undulating feel, and Professor Sherman's getting used to it. I was amazed at how fast I'd acquired my mountain legs, and felt rather proud of myself. The little beach looked very funny to me when I stopped and thought about it and compared it to beaches back home, for here the ocean was quite calm and the beach was going up and down. "'How's the swimming here?' I asked. "'Excellent,' said Mr. F. "'You'll see.' I waded in the water up to my waist and there experienced a delightful sensation. The sand beneath me rose up with the surface of the earth until I found my feet out of the water. It then lowered me down in the water up to my neck.' I stood in one place and went in and out of the water, spending a few seconds in the blazing tropical sun and then being dunked again up to my neck in the clear, cool water, up and down, in and out, without having to move at all from the place where I was standing. Can you imagine that? Mr. F. had waded out a little deeper in the water than I had and seemed to enjoy being entirely dunked up over his head at the earth's lowest drop and then rising with the earth until he was only up to his knees in the water. Once, when temporarily up to my waist, I dove in deeper, uh, dove in towards deeper water to do a little swimming. I hadn't gone very far when I felt the sand rise beneath me and lift my, my stomach up out of the water. A most peculiar feeling, I could imagine. Now, Mr. F. explained to me that it was necessary to wade out, good, uh, out quite far to do good swimming. You should walk out far enough so that you're up to your waist in the water when the surface of the earth beneath you is at the highest rising point. I did this, walking and half dog paddling, and when I was out far enough, I enjoyed a good swim. Back on the beach, Mr. F. and I decided to take a sun bath. He told me that he had found it best to let the surface of the earth roll you around when it moved, and not to try to lie in any one position. We did this and were nicely toasted on all sides in the hot sun. 
it w I was enjoying a most pleasant morning and decided right away to make this a daily habit. The night before, I had borrowed an atlas from Mr. F. and looked up Krakatoa in it before going to sleep. I found that it was situated in the Sunda Strait between Sumatra and Java. That's in the Pacific Ocean southeast of Vietnam, Thailand, Southeast Asia. You're, you're talking about you know, off into Indonesia and that type of thing towards Australia. Okay. And it was almost 25 miles from both uh, Sumatra and Java of these two huge islands. Looking at the map and trying to trace the path of my voyage in the globe, which was his giant balloon he had made that brought him here, I was amazed to see how much land I'd missed on my trip. I must have flown between Mindanao on the southern end of the Philippines and the Salibs Islands over the Salib Sea. I must have flown over Borneo one whole night, narrowly missing mountains and at times being very close to the ground. I shuddered when I tried to imagine the rude awakening I would have had if the globe had struck a mountaintop in Borneo while I was peacefully asleep in my inflated mattress. Yeah, that would be disastrous. The Pacific Ocean is the biggest body of water in the world. Krakatoa, which is only 18 square miles in size, is one of the smallest islands in the Pacific. I set out to land in Asia, the world's biggest continent, completely missed many enormous islands, traveled thousands of miles over water, and landed on this tiny piece of land. Had a sea captain set out across the Pacific Ocean for, let's say, China, and missed it by a few thousand miles and landed instead on Krakatoa, he would have been stripped of his commission and had his ship taken away from him. But to balloonists, stories such as mine are typical, and balloon trips are only considered unusual if you arrive within 100 miles or so of your planned destination. I was thinking how delightful this all was, of the freedom and surprise of balloon travel, and of the balloon merry-go-round I had taken such a fantastic trip on that afternoon. Then it occurred to me that the balloon merry-go-round was a pretty big affair, and it seemed to me that it should be visible when up in the air on a clear day from either Java or Sumatra. I asked Mr. F. about this while we were basking in the sun. Don't worry much about that, he said. There are several reasons why. One of them is that the balloon merry-go-round is painted sky blue and therefore isn't really visible from too great a distance. You might have remembered if you watched the, me reading the last chapter that the balloons from the merry-go-round uh, were indeed colored blue. Everything was blue, so it's kind of camouflage when it's up in the sky. Another is that the balloon merry-go-round never goes over five or six miles on its longest trip, and that doesn't bring it very close to either Java or Sumatra. Then, too, the mountain has a reputation for belching forth strange things, and the whirling balloons and boats look quite like a big blue smoke ring from a distance. But there is this very important reason why we don't worry about its being seen. In 1877, our second year here, the mountain was so violent that it scared the people living on the shores of the Sunda Strait in both Java and Sumatra so much that they moved their homes inland, about 25 miles on both islands. The whole of Krakatoa was violently rocked from end to end. Waves were formed in the Sunda Strait traveling outward from the island center. As a center, giant waves which swept onto the shores of Java and Sumatra, completely inundating many homes. The noise was formidable, and the waves caused so much damage that the people moved away from the tips of the islands in great haste. We have reason to believe that no one dares to live within a, 50, within a radius of 50 miles from us. Great heavens, I exclaimed. How did such an explosion affect you, who were living right here on the island? It was quite bad. Many of the huts we lived in at the time collapsed like card houses. No one was hurt much, though many of us were knocked unconscious or had our wind knocked out from being thrown abruptly to the ground. The noise of the explosion wasn't too bad on the island. I suppose the fact that we were right on the island made the noise more bearable. If you stand right near or on a large artillery piece when it is fired, you're much less bothered by the noise than if you're 50 feet away. We picked ourselves up, helped those who needed help, and went about the business of rebuilding our houses. This brought up another point that had been puzzling me. Why, I asked Mr. F., do you people live here on top of this dormant volcano, when with a handful of diamonds you could live a life of lavish ease and comfort in another country? Your question is a puzzler. 
and there is really no logical answer to it. It suggests a series of other questions of exactly the same nature. For instance, why doesn't a multimillionaire in another country consider himself rich enough to retire? Why does he try to make another million? Why do tycoon, tycoons with several millions of dollars try to make a billion, a sum so large they couldn't possibly spend it in a lifetime? As long as our diamond mines are kept secret here, we, the 20 families of Krakatoa, match the rest of the world in wealth. The diamond mines have a particular magnetic effect on us. We couldn't live happily in any other country. We would be haunted with the unbelievable dream of this unheard of wealth back on the island. Uh, this looks like a picture of the early days of Krakatoa when Mr. F was de describing that big uh, earthquake or you know uh, volcanic activity in 1877, how people, their, their original houses collapsing, people falling over. Uh, but he's saying, we would dream of the unheard of wealth back on the island. But we can't take our diamonds, that is, all of our diamonds, to another country without destroying their value. Remember, they have so many diamonds, so much that if they brought it into the rest of the world, it would bring down the value of what diamonds are worth because they never knew there was this much. So if we today take our diamonds, all our diamonds, it would destroy their value. We are slaves of our own piggishness. We've locked ourselves in a diamond prison. On the other hand, we're very happy here. And I suppose the fascination of knowing that we are, each of us, each one of us, richer than the combined uh, Medeses, Nabobs, and Croissy of history, those must be rich family names, enters, in, uh, enters too into the Krakatoan spell which keeps us here. But this spell, as you call it, seems a little unreasonable for me for the simple reason that it challenges a will of human nature that is far greater than the will to be rich, this being obviously the will to live. How can you live happily here under a constant threat of being blown sky high? Now that I think of it, this whole island is like a turkey stuffed with nitroglycerin. <laughs> That's a thought. The surface of the earth here, which is right at this moment moving us gracefully up and down, is obviously activated by molten lava. A crack in the earth's surface, and the cold waters of the Pacific would rush in. Imagine what would happen then. Cold water suddenly coming in contact with molten lava. This hollow, rumbling shell would suddenly find itself like a covered kettle of boiling water on a stove. The resulting steam would cause pressure enough to blow the top right off the whole island. No one could survive such an explosion. What good are your diamonds? What good would your diamonds do you then? We're all only too much aware of that possibility. It, pro it troubles me just to hear you mention it. We have come to look upon it this way. If it should happen, with the speed with which you have just described it, nobody here would have time to think or know what was happening to him. It would mean painless death. However, if we have a warning, which we all somehow expect to have, there is a quick escape from Krakatoa. Given as little as ten minutes to get off the island, we'll all be safe and on our way to some other country. The escape, and the fact that Krakatoa has been here an uncalculated length of time without blowing up, makes living here under the ever-present threat of extinction possible. What is this escape, I asked? Do you keep the freighter always steamed up and ready to go? It would take the freighter longer than ten minutes to leave here, said Mr. F. It's not that. It's the other invention I promised to show you yesterday. This is an invention which we all worked carefully on for many months, starting right after that big explosion in 1877. Our lives depend on it, but due to its huge size and its motivating power, we are unable to try it out. There is no reason why it shouldn't work. And when I say this, I mean no reason on paper. Its maiden voyage will have to prove its worth. It's a flying platform, a huge platform, big enough to take us all swiftly into the air within ten minutes of a warning from the mountain. A platform capable of lifting twenty families of four? I asked. This makes child's play of flying carpets. How do you hope to get it off the ground? With balloons, said Mr. F. The idea appealed to me immensely. You don't say, Professor Sherman, right? The idea of the lives of 80 people being entrusted to such fickle and unpredictable traveling companions as balloons was quite frightening but thoroughly enjoyable. You're all prepared to risk your lives in a balloon contraption. I like this very much. A little while back, I was starting to think of Krakatoans as being greedy, calculating, and traditionally dull billionaires. Now I find you're incurable romantics. Tell me, 
How can such a massive weight as that of twenty families be lifted off the ground? I beg your pardon, said Mr. F., but we are not risking our lives on any foolhardy conveyance. The balloon platform must work. It's got to work. It can't help working. Look, I'll show you. I walked over to where Mr. F. was lying. Here's Mr. F. about to draw out some sort of a diagram so you can picture him as I speak now. Uh, I, where, where Mr. F. was lying, sat down beside him and watched him as he sketched the platform in the sand. He made a bird's eye view of it and drew the 20 balloons around its edge, around its outside edge. It was rectangular in shape. He started writing numbers in the sand. I don't know how much the actual platform weighs by itself, he said. It's made of the lightest pine wood in the world, imported by us especially for this purpose from South America. It's made of light beams, with the floorboards are laid with spaces between them for greater lightness. The balustrade around the platform is of hollowed wood. The woodwork couldn't possibly have been made lighter. Before I tell you about the balloons, I want to make it clear that I'm going to give you the figures in round numbers, with the margin of error all in favor of the success of the machine. Thus, the lifting power of the balloons will be calculated as little less than it actually is, and the weight we are carrying will be compounded as heavier than it will, would actually be. There's really no accurate way of planning balloon inventions, too much depends on atmospheric conditions, the purity of the hydrogen used, and weather conditions. I'll give you the roundest figures. I understand. I just want to show you again, now that you know what he's describing, there's Mr. F, and you can see him drawing a bird's eye view of the balloons around a big rectangular platform. Let's hear the numbers. The balloon platform is lifted by 10 large balloons of 32,400 cubic, cubic feet each and 10 balloons, half as big as the larger ones, of 16,000 cubic feet each. The larger balloons will fly higher than the smaller ones, which will be situated in the spaces between the larger ones, thus alternating around the platform, one large, one high, one small, one low. I see, I said, and now you can see. Here's the drawing, and you can see the 32,000 cubic feet, 16,000 cubic feet, plenty of space there. The total hydrogen needed to fill all 20 is 486,000 cubic feet. Free hydrogen has a lifting power of roughly 70 pounds per cubic foot. Uh, per thousand cubic foot. So 70 pounds per thousand cubic feet. The 20 balloons have a combined lifting strength of 45,360 pounds. Those of you who like math probably enjoyed that. How much do you figure the 80 people will weigh? Well, he said, writing down more figures in the sand, if you divide the 80 people by sexes, half are women. If you divide them by generation, half are children. 130 pounds per person is a safe figure under these circumstances. The 80 people will weigh 10,400 pounds. But let me see, how much do you weigh? In the roundest of numbers, I answered, I weigh uh, 180 pounds. All right, said Mr. F., that makes 10,580 pounds, leaving 34,780 pounds over uh, to take care of the total weight of the platform. I agree that this all sounded very reasonable. But one thing bothers me, I said. How do you get the balloons filled with hydrogen and the platform off the ground in 10 minutes? That was our most difficult problem. Come with me. I'll show you the platform and how we think we have solved the question of a fast getaway. I put my bathrobe on and followed him through the jungle fringe. After a good long walk, we came to a clearing which was far away from the mountain as it could possibly be to get on the island, as it was possible to get on the island. The huge platform was situated here. I remember having seen it from the balloon merry-go-round the day before. I had thought then, seeing it from the air, that it was some sort of outside dancing floor with a bandstand in the middle. What I thought was the bandstand turned out to be a large steel cylinder. Mr. F. showed me four great wooden vats, one on the ground near each side of the balloon platform. There were hoses leading from the vats to the balloons in what Mr. F. described as pitchfork connections. These hoses were large and single as they left the vats, then, the, then branched off into smaller hoses, each one attached to a balloon. This is how we believe we have solved the problem of a quick takeoff. So you can see this now. This is a vat 
filled with hydrogen. It goes down here to a kind of a single tube, and then each one of those goes off to the balloons. He said, compressed hydrogen. Each of these vats contains 300,000 cubic feet of hydrogen, compressed at 1,600 pounds to the square inch. Hydrogen. The hydrogen is kept in steel cylinders, which are submerged in water in the vats to keep leakage down to a minimum and to keep the hot rays of the sun from the direct contact with the cylinders. In the event of an emergency, we will all rush to the platform, jump on, and each family will stand by a balloon. The big valves in the four vats will be turned on full force. Each family will... Uh, each family will have to see that its balloon is carefully handled so that the tremendous rush of hydrogen into it won't cause any tears, rips, or snarls. The smaller balloons will fill first. There is a lever near each balloon which controls the valve, allowing gas into it. When the small ones are three-quarters full of their valves, will be shut off. Shutting off the smaller balloon's valves will speed the filling of the big ones, since they'll be receiving all the pressure. Mr. F. then picked up one of the hoses and showed it to me. There was a small sort of ball and socket connection in each hose. He explained that it took a 150-pound pull to separate the hose from its connection. Each hose has a connection such as this, he explained. Twenty hoses make a total pull of 3,000 pounds. The balloon platform isn't tied down with ropes before the takeoff. It is held down only by these hoses. Gas rushes into the balloons until the platform rises, and there's a 3,000-pound pull on the 20 hoses. The platform then tears itself away from the hose connections and leaps into the air as if it was given a huge boost. There's a valve in the ball end of each ball and socket connection. It allows the gas to be forced into, balloon, into the balloon, but it prevents gas from escaping when the connection with the vats is broken. So I'll just show you this now. You can see it. There's the ball and socket, so... There's a little holder, and then as as it gets more filled up and there's force, this boom, pulls out like that, and you can see that the little plug falls in falls into place so the gas doesn't just shoot back out when it disconnects from the vat. It is with the hydrogen on the platform that the flight will be controlled. How do you control the flight of the platform? By adding hydrogen to the balloons. We can go higher to a certain extent. By detaching the hoses from the tank on the platform and releasing hydrogen from the balloons, we can make the platform descend. Where we go is, as usual, left entirely to the winds. However, since we carry our own hydrogen supply, there's no reason why, with any sort of wind and a minimum of luck, we can't travel a tremendous distance. How would you keep the platform level? We plan to do that much in the same way as we keep the balloon merry-go-round level, only the process will be reversed. We have no desire to take long trips in the balloon merry-go-round, so we keep it level by releasing hydrogen from the high side until it is even with the low side. On the balloon platform, we will add hydrogen to the low side and bring it up level with the high side, so the platform as a whole will gain altitude instead of descending. Each family will stand near its balloon on the platform, thus distributing the weight fairly evenly. Not bad. I mean, I'm not a balloon aeronautic person, but this seems reasonable. Um, keep it level. There's a lever near each balloon, as I've already shown you, which controls the gas going into the balloon. The boy in each family will control the lever because of his greater experience with the balloon merry-go-round. When his balloon is a little lower than the others, he'll add more gas to it and bring it up even with them. I walked around the platform. The floorboards were springy underfoot, and you could see grass underneath um, through spaces between them. I tried to imagine this huge floor in flight, looking through the boards at a city underneath. How frightening and incredible it would be to be moving through the space in such a huge piece of construction with 80 other people. The balloons were carefully folded under tarpaulins. It took, uh, I took a look at several of them. They were magnificent, made of beautiful rubberized silk, and each balloon was painted many different iridescent colors. I tried to picture the reaction of people in other countries if they were suddenly to look up in the sky and see the balloon platform, its white latticed floor bordered by a graceful balustrade over which were leaning the richly clothed Krakatoans. And you, uh, the author has drawn a picture here of Professor Sherman sitting there, and it is quite nice. So even though it's very light and it's got all this science, they keep it uh, stylish looking as well because they are billionaire uh, diamond people. The 20 brilliant balloons above 
and the frightening silence with which such a huge airship would seem suddenly to make its appearance. There's no noise in balloon travel. In any other form of travel, you're warned by some sort of noise of the approach of whatever the conveyance. Even ships cause a ripple in the waves in the calmest of waters. Balloons are silent, except on rare occasions when you might possibly hear the ghostly whistle of the wind through the ropes. There's no nicer way of traveling than in some form of lighter-than-air craft. The balloon platform would certainly make a dr delightful, attra delightfully attractive appearance if it should ever fly over any foreign country, I remarked. Its appearance played a big part in its planning, said Mr. F. It wasn't really necessary to go through all the trouble we did in making the handsome, hollow-carved wooden balustrade or to put so much thought, work, and time into the painting of the balloons. A lighter, simpler balustrade and plain balloons would have made the platform fly just as well. If we should land in other countries, we want to be welcomed as extraordinary visitors who have gaily announced their arrival, rather than to be suspected of being invaders in some sort of aerial Trojan horse. By the way, he added, have you a parachute? But that's actually a good point. So he's saying they, they made the platform and the balloons look more fantastic so that they would seem almost like something out of a dream or whatever and kind of viewed with curiosity versus something that looks sort of plain and drab and maybe militaristic. Um, that might be viewed with suspicion, like these are invaders uh, coming over. Invaders would not have a beautifully appointed ship with beautifully painted uh, balloons, right? So uh, Mr. F. just asked if he has a parachute. And Professor Sherman, of course not, I answered. I threw everything overboard on the globe. I didn't carry one anyways. I didn't feel I needed one. Each family here has a family parachute. Another invention of ours. A family parachute is so built as to keep the family of four together during a descent. Is it possible to land the balloon platform? Hardly so, said Mr. F. In the first place, it would be hard to find enough level space in which to land such a huge aircraft. And in the second place, it wouldn't be possible to deflate the balloons fast enough to prevent the wind from blowing it and dragging it across the countryside. We'd have to deflate them slowly in order to make a reasonably smooth landing. And therefore we'd be able to, and before we would be able to collapse them, the wind would drag us off, ripping the platform into splinters and endangering our lives. We wouldn't dare risk a landing in this. We plan to jump off, picking our countries and spots with care, if we ever have to take a trip on it. Professor Sherman, I would advise you get a parachute as soon as you possibly can. How can I get one in Krakatoa? I asked. See Mrs. M. She and her husband designed and made the family parachutes. I'm sure she has enough silk left over to make you an ordinary one. We went together to Mrs. M's Moroccan house, and I told Mrs. M my problem. Why, certainly, she said. I can make you a parachute, but it will take me about two weeks. But then I doubt you'll be needing it before then. I hope not, anyway, she said, laughing. Of course not, I said. Take your time. There's no rush at all. Little does he know, right? At the time. So that's the end of that chapter. There's, so he says, yeah, take your time with the parachute. There's no rush at all. But uh, I think we all know that's not true. So we have just a little bit, a few pages to go. Thanks for reading with me. I'll be back soon with the next chapter.